Hey, beloved, how you doing? This is Pastor Small reaching out to you. Hope everything is going well with you. Hope you're having a good day. I uh, just wanted to share. We're going to share a little bit uh, in this Bible study. Uh, I understand it's a little bit <clears throat> uh, daylight, uh, so it's not quite 7 o'clock. But what I figured I'd do on today, because for some of us, it's a big day in terms of the uh, vice presidential debate. So I figured that I would post early. Uh, to give guys, people a time and an opportunity to view the Bible study whenever they could and whatever time fit them. Um, so they would have time to watch uh, and see what's going on. So I um, wanted to make sure we got the lesson because we are continuing to move forward uh, in this journey of Job as we continue to move in this Job journey, uh, tears, trials, and testimonies. Um, so whenever you watch this, we hope uh, it's helpful and insightful for you. Um, <clears throat> so we're just going to get right to it. Uh, today, um, we are looking and talking about um, who are you to judge? We're going to talk about judging. We're going to talk about a little bit about judgment today. Who are you to judge? Looking at how we as individuals judge and have certain uh, perspectives about things. Um, <clears throat> so as we continue to move forward today, we're looking at Job's friend Zophar. Job's buddy Zophar is the third um, person with their input in their perspective that's going on. Uh, we've already heard from Eliphaz, we've heard from Bildad, and now uh, Job's friend Zophar has a lot to say. And Job uh, is kind of serious um, in regards to what he and Zophar go back and forth to do. Uh, there's a lot that is taking place in terms of um, their banter, uh, because it almost seems to go get worse with these friends and their opinions. And so as we continue to go through this moment and this journey with Job, we're digging deeper into the conversation of why uh, Job is wrestling with why he's in this position or why Job is wrestling with this. Um, Job has worked faithfully with this deep desire to be in relationship with God. And so Job really doesn't know why, or Job doesn't feel he deserves, quote unquote, deserves what's going on with him. Uh, Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, give him their opinions about what's going on. And Zophar is yet another friend who has input. Um, he is a friend. He's a namathite. Um, and their perspectives are all different. Um, Eliphaz is wrestling with the human experience uh, or the human history. Um, in other words, Eliphaz's position is, well, it must have been something you've done to, that this is happening to you. It must be something that's done. Bildad is wrestling with the human tradition, meaning, well, logic says if this who God is, this is what's happening to you. Zophar is a proponent of human merit. What Zophar's position is, is he's talking about merit. In other words, he's talking about if you live your life by a moral code, then what you are receiving and what you are getting is based upon what you've done. So Zophar is operating from a place of merit. You get what you deserve, in essence. So the fact that Job is going through this, Zophar's position is where well, you're getting it, so you must deserve it, okay? Let's look at um, the first part of, of chapter 11, the first five verses of chapter 11 of the book of Job. Uh, look at it, open your Bibles when you get a minute, look at it. It says, then Zophar, uh, the Namathite replied, are these words to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? Will your idle talk reduce others to silence? Will no one rebuke you when you mock? Uh, you say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I am pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. So watch this. Zophar says, I wish God would speak, uh, that he would open his lips against you. Zophar is coming with the perspective that Job is lying about being innocent. That Zophar is saying, you're a liar. You're not telling the truth. You must have done something wrong because Job is after you. I mean, because God is after you. And so as a result of that, there must be something going on with you and there must be a problem. So understand, 
this is not about others' perspectives. This is not about the other perspectives of Job. There must be something you need to ask God to forgive you. That's not, that's Eliphaz's position. That's Bildad's position. That's not Zophar's position. Some things, some things you forgot, right? Maybe it's something you forgot. Maybe it's something you didn't do. Maybe it's something you missed. Maybe it's something that didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> maybe you sinned somewhere, Job, and you did not notice, right? That might be the reason you're in this. That might be the reason. That's what his other friends are saying. Remember what we discussed uh, early on in this, in this lesson, that some sins are by omission and some are by commission, right? Meaning some are conscious what we do and some are unconscious, okay? Uh, Zophar is saying under no certain terms, he says, Job, you're wicked. Zo Zophar's position is you're wicked. You're lying about what you did. You did something wrong and you need to own up it too. That's the only reason this has happened to you is because you, you've got a wicked core. If God could speak in this moment, God would say you're a liar. If God could speak in this moment, God would call you out, right? So look at Job 11, 11 through 12. So stay in the same chapter, 11 through 12 says, surely he recognizes deceivers, deceivers. He says he recognizes deceivers. And when he sees evil, does he not take note? But the wit, the witless can no more make wise than a donkey colt can be born a human. Right. He says, God, does, does, isn't God smart enough to understand hustlers when God sees it? God knows a hustler when he sees it. God knows somebody who's not honest and upfront when he sees it. God recognizes that. So because you're going through this, God is recognizing your hypocrisy. God is recognizing somewhere where you aren't true. You're playing holy, but you're not living it because there's something you've done. Because and it brings you to a place of wickedness. You must be wicked, Job. This is Zophar's position. You must be wicked, Job, because this is happening to you. You got to be wicked because it's happening to you. You must have done something wrong because this is the only reason you're going through it. Zophar, as a friend, is not pulling any punches. Zophar is not pulling any punches. Zophar is letting Job know that only wicked hearts find themselves in this place. Only wicked hearts can be in this particular moment. Zophar believes that Job can't escape what he's done. That you can't get out of what you've done. This is what's happening to him. According to Zophar, this is Job's chickens coming home to roost. According to Zophar, this is what's happening because God is getting you. This is what's going down, right? This is your chickens coming home to roost. Look at verse 20 in chapter 11. But the eyes of the wicked will fail. Their escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. The boy wouldn't have, and that, that we do that. We do that all the time. Right. You know, this is happening. <clears throat> a tragedy can happen. And what we'll do is we'll make excuse. Right. To make us feel better about the position. Right. Boy, wouldn't have gotten shot if he wasn't out or sitting on that stoop after dark. Everybody know you're supposed to be in the house after dark. Right. Stuff to make us feel better. If Emmett Till would have just kept his mouth shut and not whistled at that woman, he'd be alive today. Right now, we now know the lady lied and, you know, she wasn't truthful about her accusations. Right. But, you know, if he had just kept his mouth shut, if you just keep your head down, if you just leave it alone. Right. Mike Brown, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Jacob Blake, they got criminal records. If they just do what the police say, you know, we, it's understandable why they get shot or why they do that. You know, we make excuses. Right. So what we do is we blame the individual for behavior so we can feel better about the event that happened. We give reason and rationale for events uh, when we can blame persons for things that are happening. Here it is. Here's a word you're going to learn today. Zophar is dogmatic. <clears throat> dogma. The word dogma. Zophar is dogmatic. And the definition of dogmatic, dogmatic means stating an opinion in an assertive or arrogant manner. Uh, strong expressions of opinions as if they were facts. That's something that's somebody who is dogmatic. Somebody who is dogmatic states what they believe like it's an actual fact. It's, it's a fact and, and, and you can't convince them otherwise. And they come across really, really assertive and they come off really, really arrogant about it. That's what to be, to be dogmatic is about, to operate from this dogma. Right. The dogma is to operate in, in the sense of this is the line, this is the ridge, and you can't go one way or the other. You got to stay this way. That's dog. That's to be dogmatic. Um, now, understand, all of us are dogmatic in some ways. All of us have a particular idea of, of being dogmatic. All of us do that. 
We got strong opinions, what we got strong opinions about. That's just how we do it. We got all of us have strong opinions about something, right? Uh, especially when it comes to faith. When it comes to religion, a lot of us are dogmatic. Many of us have uncompromising ideas about particular things, right? The KKK is dogmatic, right? We never said it was rational. We just said it's a, it's a perspective and a philosophy that people, that you can't change the mind, right? It's arrogant and it's unrelenting and it's assertive. It's KKK, they're dogmatic in their beliefs that the problem with America is minorities and, you know, everybody else trying to take um, white people's power away. White nationalists is all dogmatic. And what happens is if you subscribe to a dogmatic philosophy, you can ultimately become a zealot in your nature. Some of you know that they're biblical people called zealots and zealots were people who were fanatical and they were uncompromising. Zealots were rebels to the resistance of the Roman Empire in the Bible. But to be a zealot in our current understanding, to be a zealot is somebody who is fanatical and uncompromising in their pursuit of religious, political or other ideas uh, to the point where they don't. They don't stay uh, focused on anything else. That's only the goal that they have in a particular area, right? So for me, I'm dogmatic in the idea of understanding that my doctrine speaks to a sense that God is love, right? That God, the essence of God is love and God desires to revolutionize the human condition. I believe that, that God wants to revolutionize the human condition um, here on heaven and earth. And he wants to join heaven and earth together. And he does that through the example of Jesus Christ, his son, who gives us hope and possibility to adjust our situation. That to me is the core of who I am. I am dogmatic in that approach. And I am, I am zealous. I'm even zealous about that, right? Because I believe that doesn't exclude anybody. That includes everyone. And so because of that radical kind of perspective, I can be considered dogmatic. And some of us in some particular ways, we get considered dogmatic in that. But dogma can be problematic. Dogma can be problematic because we shut ourselves off to other opinions. We shut ourselves off to other possibilities and perspectives that people operate from a place of dogma for different reasons. People do operate from a place of dogma because they need structure. Right. There's some folk who need structure. Right. If I don't have if I don't have it this way, I'm all over the place. So I need to have the structure because they feel they need a sense of truth, you know, because they're searching for a sense of truth. And absolutely. It's interesting because a lot of people who consider themselves atheists or non-believers, it's not that they don't believe what they struggle with is their sense of truth. And because the reality is, and I'm going to push y'all a little bit right here. The reality is, is because of having faith and having religion, it's not about truth. We operate in a place of faith. We operate based upon what we believe. And that's a problem for those folk who need truth, right? The constant pursuit of truth. And there's nothing wrong with truth. But this faith, as Hebrews 11 says, is the, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. So we operate with a sense of assuredness. Right. That what we believe is true, but it's still a faith movement. It's still a faith declaration. And that proves problematic for some people. So people can be dogmatic because they need it to be true. Right. I need it to be true. The KKK, those folk, um, Aryan nations, those proud boys and all those white nationalist groups. Right. They need that to be true, because if it's not true, then where do they stand? If it's not true, where is my life? If it's not true, what does what does it all really mean? What have I been fighting for all of this time? If 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 it does if it is not true that we are superior or better or more intelligent or a greater race of people than everybody else if that is not true then what does that mean so i need it right so i'm incredibly dogmatic i'm incredibly rigid about what i let in and perspectives i let in right we've we've run into conversations uh even particularly in this political season we've run into conversations about that with different people maybe at work and maybe people we've run into and in shopping and interacting right we're trying to explain a position right but it's but it, to them it's got to be about you know, the president and the president, no, the president is being beat up, the president, right? It's like, you know, we continue this this movement of understanding what it is, uh, dog, dogmatic thinking, right? So there are those who are saying, listen, this president is ill-equipped. And they say, well, the, the deep state is working against him. Listen, this president does not tell the truth. And they say, well, no, he does tell the truth. And then Bob Woodward's book comes out and we talk about his cover up for COVID-19, right? And 
they still make an excuse. They say, you know, this whole coronavirus thing is a hoax. And we say, no, this coronavirus thing has been reinforced by doctors and people who are scientists and people who understand and study. And they, But the dogmatic say, no, you know, the president said it's a hoax. So now the president is infected with the virus. And so they make an excuse about that. But it's not that serious. He said it's just like the flu. It's not that serious. And it's like, when will you understand, right, that there's another perspective, that there's another way to look at this thing? Because... If I don't stick with it, if I don't remain dogmatic in my perspective, if I don't remain here, then it means that my theory or my idea of who he is or what he is or what America is falls apart. And so a lot of times people have to be dogmatic. They, they, they choose to be dogmatic and stay that rigid because they don't want to hear possibility because it means that they have to what it means to be connected and in relationship, right? Um, so they do it because they need structure. They do it because they're looking for a sense of truth. They do it because they want to be on the side of right, what they believe is the side of right. Uh, so they'll stay very, very rigid or because they have in the past gone too far and don't believe anything. And now they need to believe in something, right? whole lot of reasons why people can be so rigid and be so dogmatic in their thinking and their perspective. Um, but if you can cut yourself off, um, to the idea that you can think you're the only one that's right, then you can mess around and miss opportunities to grow, right? You mess around and miss moments to grow. You miss opportunities to connect. You miss this re moments where you see different perspective. You miss moments where you can actually stay in tune and grow uh, in different relationship and different kinds of connection. If God is possibility, if what we believe, God is full of possibility and God presents possibility. The song says, morning by morning, new mercies I see. If we understand that God is possibility, then you have to open yourself up to the possibilities God offers. You can't close yourself off the possibility and be that dogmatic and be that rigid and be that closed that you can't receive what God has for you or, or the possibilities that God can show you, right? We, we hear it all the time of Klansmen who you know, interact with African Americans individuals and then realize, you know, that their ideas and perspectives are wrong, right? Or they fall in love with an African American woman and then all of a sudden they've got a different kind of perspective, right? That God creates possibility, right? That there are places in our lives where we may have been rigid in some things, but God showed us something different and we understand that there can, it can be seen in a different way. Ephesians chapter two, uh, verse eight says, for it is by grace you have been saved, right? Through faith. And it is not by yourselves, but it is a gift from God. So the whole idea of our rigidity in terms of keeping or preserving our salvation is, is, is a, is a complex idea because it's not, it's not what we do that makes us saved. It's our belief in, in God that makes us saved. It's our belief in Jesus Christ as savior that brings us to this place of salvation. And so we have to understand understand that you have to be careful. I, I mean, like I'm saying, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not attacking what you believe. What I'm attacking is how you believe it. <laughs> or I'm not attacking, but I'm challenging to understand how you believe it because a dogmatic perspective can limit pers openness and seeing how God can move. So you want to be careful about the places where you're dogmatic. We're, like I said, we're all kind of, we all have a dogma. We all have a dogmatic approach, a, a literalist idea, some core values that we hold on to. And I'm not telling you and that's wrong. What I'm telling you is always be open to the movement of what God can do in the spirit and how the spirit opens those things up. So here's some of the reasons real quick as we talk. I want to talk for a while. Here's some of the reasons why we can be judgmental. So far in this moment, it's been quite judgmental. He's been judgmental of Job, right? He's, per, he's, per, he's pretended or perceived to understand Job's condition. He's perceived to know Job better than Job knows himself, right? And not only that, that. He's perceived to know God better than anybody in the conversation. And that's what judgmental people can do. But here's some of the reasons where, why uh, people are judgmental the way they are. One reason people are judgmental is because it's a self-esteem issue. Um, individuals who have a hard time feeling connected and confident about their own lives, their own abilities, their own contributions and, and what they give to the world uh, often become judgmental in order to compensate for what they feel they personally don't have. So, uh, so for, for example, somebody who judges constantly um, 
oftentimes has insecurities and uses those judgments about other people to make them feel better, right? Uh, they want to feel better about their own deficits, all right? So they can be conscious deficits or unconscious. This can happen consciously or unconsciously, but because I feel a certain way, because I'm, I'm insecure, because I'm not, you know, necessarily confident in mine, you know, then I attack I, or I, I criticize and I'm judgmental about what you do. Uh, the young people have a terminology for it. Now they call it haters, right? Uh, so folk, the folks who operate in the context of hating, you know, so things go well for you. They say, oh, well, you're going to mess it up. Well, I don't even know how he got that. Or he don't really deserve that, right? Or things go well for you and they start telling your business, right? They start telling where you fell or what you used to do or how it used to go. I remember when I remember them when they used to not have. I remember them when they was, you know, doing this or doing that. Right. So it, it comes from a place of deficit. It comes from a place of competition. It comes from a place of feeling somehow or another you're not recognized or acknowledged. Another way, another place people can be judgmental is because it comes from a place of envy. Right. That you may know somebody who constantly envies others. Right. Somebody who has difficult time uh, for being proud, happy or genuinely supportive. Um, these individuals have character deficits themselves and issues with self-esteem. Um, but they they really judge other people based upon what they think or what they believe, you know, their own jealousies, you know, and their own willingness um, of other people's success, you know, it, it has to be criticized. Another reason is self-righteousness. And this is a big one in the religious world, in the religious circles that we operate with. People who think they have everything in control and people who I try to control everything, I operate with a sense of perfection, rarely have compassion for others. Um, and the reason why is because folks operate with a sense of uh, people who operate with that level of sense of control, uh, they're trying to operate and, and keep the world a certain way. And when the world doesn't go that way, they can have a tendency to be cre incredibly critical of it, right? They want to shun it because they want to feel better and reinforced about what they're doing and the world that they're creating as opposed to the world that is. Um, so they rarely have compassion for others. Uh, they prejudge everybody. You know, they, they, they don't trust a lot of people. Um, and people who don't trust usually can't be trusted, right? So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that folks who, in, in quote me on that, that's, that's human behavior science. People who don't trust usually shouldn't, are not good at being trusted, right? Um, because they will do whatever is necessary to keep, um, and, you know, to keep things in a certain framework and to keep things a certain way. Um, so they, they expect perfection. Uh, from others, but while allowing grace for themselves, um, even if they claim they don't expect perfection, they'll do that silently um, and expect it. So when you fall out of uh, the the, perf the perfect box, it's easy to criticize and talk about what needs to take place. Now, again, like I said, they can make excuses as to, for reason and justify what they do, but they can be incredibly critical of certain things. Uh, and one of the reason, that, another reason, final reason, they people can operate and be a place of judgment is because the bias. Just overall bias. Individuals who gay, um, who engage in a lot of presumptions, can be discriminatory. People who have ideas about people in general, people who have ideas about uh, people of different ethnic backgrounds, people who have ideas about uh, gender, women, people who have ideas about uh, sexual orientation. You know those kinds of presumptions and those kinds of judgments. Um, before they actually get to know people, before they actually get to know the truth, before they actually get to know the actual situation, they can prejudge certain things. And Zophar is no different, right? Zophar in this particular text is no different. Zophar professes to know how Job is, who Job is. And so he professes to talk about all this as to why this is happening to him. It's coming from a very presumptuous place, right? Um, so uh, bias happens uh, a lot of times, even in the race idea, right? So when people see you, they think they already know all about you, right? That's, that's what happens, right? So when you walk into a store and you get followed, that's presumption, right? Uh, you know, the white ladies following you around the stores because of the presumption that she has that because you are a black woman, you're going to steal, right? Or, you know, when somebody gets on the elevator and they get on the elevator with me, they have a presumption, you know, so they're clutching their 
their, their purses and, you know, sliding over, right? There's certain ideas that people have been told. I think I've shared with New Calvary several different times that my brother came home, my middle brother Michael came home one day and asked uh, my mother where the extra bone in our body was. And my mother said, boy, what are you talking about? You know, she's like, boy, what are you talking about? And he was like, nah, I'm, I'm using, I'm making up a name. But Jeffrey said that black people have an extra bone in their behinds, which is why their behinds were so big. Yo, now that sounds like elementary school because, you know, he couldn't have been more than third or fourth, fifth grade max, right? But process that for a second. I want you to process that for a second. That's the conversation that little Jeremy has going on in his house, right? His mother, his father, his aunts, uncles, whatever. When they gather, when they talk about black people, African-Americans, that's the conversation. That's some of the dialogue they have, right? So if they have dialogue about being different anatomically, being different as human beings, Right. What are the other presumptions, presumptions that take place when people engage? Right. And, and everybody's guilty of it to some degree. Right. Everybody's guilty of it. You know, we can all be presumptuous in a lot of different ways. We can all buy in to uh, stereotypes and biases and prejudices and all of that kind of stuff. But and we do that as well, particularly religiously. Right. We're quick to believe. Right. The worst about people. That's tragic. Isn't it tragic that in the church and in the body of believers, we're quick to believe the worst about each other as opposed to buy into God is still doing something good with you. That even in the places where I do fall, even in the places where I do fall short, we can't say, well, you know what? God is doing something. God is still doing something with you. God is still moving. God is still creating. God is still operating in ways that possibility can work with you, even in those places where it might, you might not be successful in this moment. Right. Even in those places where you aren't successful right now, there's still opportunity for God to do something different with you. So I believe and invest in the power of possibility rather than the issue or the problem or the thing that has you hung up in your current context. That our idea of reframing this thing about how we function and how we operate um, becomes essential um, overall to, to how we live and operate and function as believers. I think that's essential. I think that's critical. Um, so we buy into biases. We buy into biases. We, we carry those and then we profess to know better than some people who are going through. So um, John 7, 24 says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Do not judge with appearances, but judge the right judgment. That's a don't look at the book by its cover kind of situation. Don't get caught up in what it looks like, right? Don't get caught up in what, you know, what somebody might be saying. Don't get caught up in, you know, the whole idea of the presentation, right? Because there's a whole lot more. You're more than what you look like. Right. You're more than the moment. You're more than the mistake. You're more than the issue. You're more than the problem you're in. Right. You're much more than that. You're much more than the situation that you find yourself in. Right. Because there's some situations that you didn't put yourself in. There's some that you did, but there's some that you didn't. And so you're more than that. And so to come from a perspective or as to as to believe that we come from a better understanding because of what somebody's going through, or what somebody's in is a totally incorrect thing. Don't judge by the appearance, but make sure you have the right kind of judgment. But watch this. Job does respond to Zophar's perspective. Job gives his response. Job has always responded to his friends. Job never just let them say whatever they wanted to say. So Job gives this response. And in chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 3, Job says, but I have a mind as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. I love that part. We need to we need to embrace that. Put that on shirts. People like tattoos, get a tattoo of Job 12.3. But I have a mind as well as you. 
I am not inferior to you. Who does not know all of these things? Job is saying, what you're telling me about God, I don't, it's not, I don't, it's not, I don't already know that. It's not that I don't already understand. I understand God as much as you do. I have, you know, Job has a feeling that Zophar feels that he has some kind of superiority over him, some kind of place and believes that Job is not on his spiritual level, that he's not on his understanding about understanding or, or seeing or discovering what God has done or how God moves. But Job responds, I'm well familiar with the ways of God. I know how God operates. I walk with the Lord. I talk with God. I'm well familiar with God. I don't know. I might know. I don't know everything, but I know how God moves and how God operates. So this would be a, a duh moment, you know, for if that two friends have, you know what I'm saying? You know, uh, duh, you know, one of those kind of moments. Uh, but part of the reason we like to judge others in their moments of struggle or suffering uh, is because it gives us a sense of superiority and it gives us a good feeling about it, right? Uh, Job tells them that they're not experts on his situation, right? That's a hallelujah shout right there. He said, yeah, he says, you're not an expert on my situation, right? Nobody's an expert on your situation, right? Um, so they need to leave room for what he's feeling, in this moment, you got to make room for what somebody's feeling. You can't just operate in this context and in this place that you know my story just because you see me going through something. You know all about me. You know, the, you know what I deserve, what I don't deserve. You know how good I am, how bad I am. You can't make all of that up. You can't be that judgmental. All you can do is operate in the place of support and prayer for one another and how we function. Job 13 verses four and five says, you, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. This is Job talking. If you would be altogether silent for you, that would be wisdom. Ah, that's a moment. That's a moment, right? Job says, he said, you smear me with lies. He said, you are worthless physicians. Y'all ain't helping nobody. He said, but if y'all were to be quiet, that would be the blessing, right? Y'all would be a blessing to me if y'all would just shut up. <laughs> if y'all would be quiet, that, that, that would be, that would be beneficial. Sometimes when it comes to somebody else's situation, we, it's not about what we think, right? This is helpful for somebody here today. Somebody doesn't need your opinion when they're going through. Somebody doesn't need you to talk about, well, you know, you did this and you know, and you know, well, you know, well, what, well, well, I'm going to tell you why, why it was, I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm Sometimes people don't need that. Sometimes people don't need to be assaulted or beat up or judged in the moments when they're going through. It's not always about having something to say. Sometimes we have to learn the power of golden silence. There is still a power in being present, even if you don't say anything. Gardner Taylor, pastor of Concord Baptist Church, who has gone home to be with the Lord, um, and Sam Proctor wrote a book some years ago called We Have This Ministry. And in the book, Dr. Taylor talks about the power of presence. He talks about there's ministry in presence, right? Sometimes, and some of you can attest and understand this, sometimes it means so much when somebody just shows up and sits next to you and just hold your hand. It ain't about, oh, come on, let's search and see what God has to say in this moment. Oh, come on, let's get a prayer and a word from God. Sometimes just to sit still and to be in presence with somebody. When somebody feels all alone, when somebody feels like nobody's considering them, when somebody feels like they've been misunderstood, when somebody feels like they've been turned around, sometimes just the presence. How good have you felt, right, when, when you were in a situation and it was, and somebody you were familiar showed up and you were like, yo, man, it's good to see you. It's just good to, I'm glad you're here, right? There's something about the power of presence that speaks to us. And so we shouldn't minimize it. We shouldn't reduce the power of presence in our lives. And it doesn't mean you have to say anything. So, see, the, the, the pressure is, the challenge is, oftentimes we are looking so hard to be profound and to be helpful. But the reality is sometimes the help is just in being there. Sometimes the help is just to say, I'm here with you, right? Sometimes the help is just to sit there and say, listen, I don't know what to say. 
I don't know what to say in this moment. I don't know what to tell you. I don't have the answer. I don't have the perspective. I don't know how to read this. I don't know what God is up to. But what I can tell you that as a person who believes that God can work this out, I'm right here with you. That's it. It's not about trying to be deep. It's not about trying to be uber profound. It's not about trying to have a whole lot of different things. Just what it is to be present. And not and not trying to be, you know, super hyper theologically deep or super duper saved. Nobody needs all of that. Just be present. You know what I'm saying? It's not about offering sometimes. Sometimes it's just about being available. Right? So Job 20, Job 20, um, chapter 20, verses 2 and 3 says, My troubled thoughts prompt me to answer because I'm greatly disturbed. Right? I hear the rebuke that dishonors me and my understanding inspires me to reply. Guess who that is? That's Zophar again. Zophar with his old, you know, know-it-all self. Zophar is saying, well, listen, it sounds like you're insulting me. It sounds like you're questioning my, my spirituality. It sounds like you're wondering if I have faith or if I am faithful enough for you. Zophar makes the point about him again. Understand this, beloved, as believers and those who operate in this place of fellowship, particularly in this in-between time, particularly in this moment when we're in this in-between place, right? When we're in between, you know, our struggle and our breakthrough, when we're in between and wrestling with God to find out what's God going to do on the other side of this. In this in-between, sometimes uh, we have a tendency to make it about us. But it's not. Sometimes we just have to be able to understand that we have to take ourselves out the equation, right? That we have to operate in a place where we're just trying to be faithful, right? And how we move forward. And so Zophar makes it about him. This is Job's issue, but he's trying to make it about him. So what you trying to say about me? Job say, yo, back up. You don't know my story like that. Back up. But Zophar feels judged now. Zophar all of a sudden feels judged. He wants to make sure that he's telling Job uh, what he can't get away with in regards to God's wrath. You can't escape God's wrath. You can't escape God and what God is doing. That's not what Job is saying at all. Right. But look at uh, in chapter 20, look at verses 27 and 29. It says the heavens will expose his guilt. The earth will rise up against him. A flood will carry off his house, rushing waters on the day of God's wrath. Such is the fate God allots the wicked, the heritage appointed for them by God. Right? It's not that Job is trying to get out of God's wrath. It's not that Job is trying to get out of God's punishment. Job is trying to understand God's movement in the moment. It's not that he's trying to escape it. It's he's trying to understand why is this happening to me? And all of us can understand that. All of us have been in that place before when we say, God, why am I going through this? God, what is going on? God, I'm just trying to understand this thing. That's where Job is. Job just wants to understand why this is happening. He would prefer it not to happen. But God, why am I going through this? That's where Job is. So far has totally missed the point of this thing. He's not trying to escape it. If Job could understand what was happening, then he would say, okay, God, that's what it is. But so far has made himself the judge and the jury in this particular place. Right. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse seven says, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. We have to have a mentality that looks to help and encourage. We got to have a mindset that looks to encourage one another, like for real. Like we live in a world right now, man, where. We can't even encourage people who have different opinions than we do. And that's a dangerous place to be. You know what I'm saying? I, I, used, to, I used to have a, a, a boss. I used to work under a pastor who used to say a clock, a broken clock is right at least two times a day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That a broken clock is right at least twice a day. Right. So there, there's something from people you don't always agree with or people who you may have different opinion with. There's something that you can still glean. There's something you can still get from. And so we want to make sure that we're not cutting people off. Right. In the sense that, you know, we actually can't be encouraging and can't be helpful. That's a hard place to be sometimes. I know there's a heart and there's a thumb up for that. That's a hard place to be sometimes. Right. I, I I mean, you know, not telling any names, of, but full disclosure, you know, I've talked to clergy all over this country and I've been like, yo, your president got COVID. You praying? 
you know, and there's been a whole lot of different answers. You know what I'm saying? That's a hard place to be encouraging, right? To particular people we have philosophical differences with because we can be dogmatic, because we can be rigid in our perspective and our understanding. But our assignment is to build community. Now, we can make arguments about who wants to build community with us, but our assignment is to build community. We have to always be in a place where we are building community. Ephesians chapter four, verse 29 says, let no corruption talk come out of your mouths, but only such is as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. But our assignment is that we have to make sure that we are building one another up. That our job is to make sure that we are encouraging in all things. That we don't minimize um, or, or become judgmental. That we don't profess to know all about somebody else's story or somebody else's journey. That what we need to do is we need to be encouraging. We need to be prayerful. When somebody's going through, it's not really a time... <sighs> Not really a time to celebrate. Forgive me, Lord. That when somebody's going through, it's not really time to celebrate. Right? But it's about time to... Now, that's not to say we can't be prophetic. It's not to say we can't always share. It's not to say we can't always explain. Right? Because there is cause and effect. But it still doesn't mean that we don't need... We need to walk away not being encouraging. There's still places we can be encouraging to those who need it the most. So this week, I want you to think about and be honest. Where are those places in your life where you might be a little bit more rigid than you need to be? Where are those places that you cut off God's possibility instead of open yourself up to God's possibility? Right? Where, 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 where have you closed yourself off as opposed to where have you opened yourself up? Places where, you know, can't nobody tell you nothing. And the other thing is, I want you to think about is, where are those places where you've been judgmental? Where are those places where you've prejudged or judged too soon or judged too quickly? And what situations do you find yourself judging too soon or too quickly? Yeah. Process that for this week. Process that as you understand and you reflect on those things. Because it, all of us are guilty of it. All of us are guilty of it. And all of us have had those experiences and all of us have had those moments. So my prayer is that you would just continue to be stretched in a whole lot of different ways. That all of us would. And that we would see God's grace a little bit deeper, a little bit broader we would understand that we are recipients of that grace each and every day. So yeah, today we did this early because I really thought that people were going to be watching the debate tonight uh, and weren't going to really sign in and chime in. Um, so you can play this throughout the day. You can tell other people. You can share it on your timeline. You can do whatever you need to do uh, to let other people see it. Please make sure you subscribe to New Calvary Norfolk VA's YouTube page and Facebook page. Grateful for all y'all. See my cousin. What's up, Cousin Hunter? Um, what's up, Sister Hall? See all y'all on here doing your thing, shouting out. Um, New Calvary is trying to continue just to grow and do things differently and move in a different way. And so um, I saw you, Reverend Brown, say this time works for you. So maybe we'll drop a couple of these around this time of day, too. Um, maybe a little uh, virtual lunch break uh, as we go, as we move along the rest of this year. Uh, but know that we are praying for you. Um, know that we are praying for your situation, your family and whatever is happening with you. Um, please know that at 11 o'clock, we're going to be worshiping uh, the Reverend Dr. Eugene L. Gibson, uh, pastor-elect of Mount Olivet Church in Columbus, Ohio, is going to be sharing uh, because it is going to be, uh, he's preaching for my birthday as I turn 49, the last year of 50, the last year before we hit 50. 
Uh, so we're going to make it meaningful and we're going to make it significant. So if you can, uh, please tune in this Sunday. We'd love to share with you. Uh, it'll be in our, during our worship service and we'll be getting together. Um, so if you're watching tonight, don't throw anything. Thank you, Sister Ville. Don't throw anything at your television. Uh, you know good and well. Thanks, Sister Whitehead. Um, don't throw anything at your TV. We know what the Trump people are going to do. We know what they're going to say. We know how it's going to go. Um, but we ourselves want to listen to our sister uh, and be encouraging and hopeful. It's a very historic moment. First African-American, first person of color uh, to be vice president candidate. Uh, first one. Because you can't. <laughs> because you can't. Um, so, uh, because you have to get another TV, that's why, <laughs> because you have to get another television. Um, so, uh, appreciate it, y'all. Um, uh, thanks for being flexible because that's what being in the body of faith is about. And that's what being God's children are about, being flexible with each other. So we hope this was a blessing to you. We hope you share it. Let other people know. So let's have a word of prayer. And I uh, hope you all have a rest, great rest of your day. God, we love you so much. We are grateful for uh, the opportunity and the time to come together and to share. Uh, grateful, God, for always being in our midst. Uh, no matter how many gather, your presence is with us in all things. And so as we share, as we do what you have assigned us to do, we want to make sure, God, that you are pleased with us. So help us, God, to not be judgmental, but to understand what it is to walk with and to be in relationship with uh, one another as believers. And let us understand what it is to be encouraging and to understand the power of the tongue and to understand the power of what it is we do with one another. We pray, God, right now for healing, for health, for wellness, for all those who may be going through. We pray for families right now. We pray, God, we even pray and extend for those who are dealing with COVID-19, even in this season, even those in the White House, God. Uh, we pray for them and we pray for those workers. We pray for those housekeepers. We pray for those domestics. We pray for those who take care of other people who have come across this virus. Heal them, God, in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would strengthen the work of our hands so that we would continue to be faithful and have a voice to speak up and to speak out. That we believe that you are a God that moves and you are a God of change. So we are believing it to be so. But let us do our part. Let us do what is required so that you may meet us in that place of victory. We give you honor and we give you praise. Bless New Calvary family. Bless other places of worship. Bless those who continue to work on today. Keep them safe. Those who are in offices, those who are even in their homes, those who are traveling the streets, keep them safe. Keep them wise. Let masks do what they're supposed to do. Let them be covered, not only in their faces, but God covered in your anointing. And God, in all things, we give you praise, honor, and glory. For it is in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. And we say amen and amen. All right, y'all, God bless you. We'll see you next time. Y'all be good. Grateful sharing with you. Uh, we'll talk to you. Y'all be careful tonight. All right, don't hurt nobody. Y'all be good. Peace.